Okay, folks, so you are all very welcome to the February meeting of Governance and Strategic Planning. I'm going to pass over to John for the notice and summons of the meeting and the roll call. Thank you, Chair, and good afternoon, members, to all members of the Governance and Strategic Planning Committee. You are hereby summoned to attend the monthly meeting of the committee, which will be a hybrid meeting conducted remotely via WebEx and physically here in the Council Chamber uh, in the Guildhall, Tuesday, the 31st of January at 4 o'clock. Alderman Bresland. Here, John. Alderman Devaney. Here, John. Alderman Hussey. Alderman Thompson. Here, John. Councillor Raymond Barr. Here, John. Councillor Donnelly. Councillor Farrell. Here. Councillor Heaney. Oh, geez, John. Councillor Jackson. And Shaw. Councillor McGinley. And Shaw. Councillor McHugh. Sure. Councillor Mooney. Councillor Norris. And Councillor Tierney. Thank you, members. Thank you, John. Um, so, item three is our broadcasting statement. Uh, I would like to remind everyone present at this meeting in the Guild Hall or in attendance remotely that this meeting will be broadcast live to the internet and will be capable of repeated viewing. This broadcast may be terminated or suspended in accordance with our protocol. Due to your attendance at this meeting, you are consent to be informed and to the use and storage of those images for broadcasting or training purposes and for the purposes of keeping historical records and making those records available to the public. Members and approved speakers are reminded to only have their mics and cameras on while speaking at the meeting and to use the chat facility to highlight a request to speak. A copy of the Council's privacy notice may be found on the Council website. So moving on, item four is declarations of members' interests. Um, if anybody has any items on the agenda that they need to declare interest for, you can do it now or at any point throughout the meeting, and that'll be recorded. Which moves us to item five, uh, which is our deputation today. Um, and we're delighted to welcome Chris Conway, John Class, Mark Montgomery, and Tony McDade from TransLink, um, who are all here in person today. Um, we're delighted to have you with us, and we will get your presentation on screen, and we'll hand over to yourselves, and then afterwards we'll open it up for questions from members um, and responses, okay? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, okay. So, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I just want to, we're going to flick through a short presentation and then obviously open it up for questions. I want to do a little bit of an introduction, but also I've brought colleagues along. So John Glass is Director for Infrastructure and Projects. So John can talk through some of the infrastructure spend on the railway in the northwest. Um, and also we have to my left here, Mark Montgomery, who's the route manager for the Derry Line. Um, and Tony McDade, who's the uh, uh, manager for bus services in, in FOIL. And... Um, both of those, my colleagues, Mark and Tony, you know, on a day to day basis, they would be your go to people for, for issues and things like that as well. So I wanted to bring them along and introduce them to you um, so that you know where to go to for, for day to day issues. Um, so we're going to go through a short presentation. We cover investment. We cover some of the key issues we've had recently uh, and how we've handled those and what we want to do to you know, improve that situation going forward as well. Um, so first of all, the first couple of charts are just a little bit of introduction charts. The um, first one is about public transport. So the next chart. And, and you know, we recognise that public transport is about delivering for, for Northern Ireland as a whole. It supports climate change and what we want to do in terms of the just transition as well. It supports the green growth strategy and the energy strategy in terms of transition to uh, um, zero emission uh, vehicles uh, and also supports the clean air strategy. Uh, and you know, as well as that, you know, connecting people to the economy, connecting people to jobs, to health uh, is a really important aspect of public transport. So we recognise it's important that we have a, a strong public transport network in Northern Ireland and for, for Derry as well. Next chart. The, the, the real challenge we all have is that we have significant underfunding in our public transport network for, for uh, many years now. Um, certainly over the last decade, the, the, the little line, the sort of uh, green line at the bottom uh, is the funding per capita in Northern Ireland. Uh, and the other lines uh, is the funding per capita in the other regions of the UK and the other devolved governments um, and England as well. And you can see that for, for a number of years now, we've had significant under, investing, under uh, investment on a per capita basis. And that's not just capital, that's also revenue as well. And the revenue is required to run the services on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, I suppose that's something that um, has been a challenge over a number of years, but 
in the current budget situation is going to be an even bigger challenge for us um, going forward. And I know um, there's requests daily I get for increased services and increased frequencies and all those types of things. They're just very difficult for us to deliver right now in, in the current budget situation. Um, and in fact, even the service we are delivering could be a real challenge for us next year as well. Next chart. So just a little bit about Translink in the Northwest before I hand over to my colleagues. Um, um, we have about 500 direct jobs in, in the local area and um, delivering about 17 million pounds to the local economy just through those, those direct jobs. Um, we deliver 8 million passenger journeys per annum in the Northwest. Uh, obviously, our main services are the Derry London Derry rail line, um, but also in terms of bus services, we've got an extensive bus network with Foyle Metro, uh, the 212 coach connection between Belfast and Dublin, which runs right up until midnight, uh, with the X3 and X4 four coach connection to Dublin which we now run on our own. We used to do that as a, as a, as a bus share with other operators, but Translink delivers that service on its own now. Uh, we have a range of Ulster bus connections uh, right across the, the geography, uh, and also we deliver most the majority of the school services as well. So providing a very vital public transport network for, for everyone in, in the local area. So I'm going to hand over to John Glass now, John, just on the next chart, it's going to take us through a little bit about the investment we've been putting in recently into the railway. Uh, everyone, um, real infrastructure investment um, historically across all of the network has been very much under what has been required. Uh, you can see the green stag bar there is the dairy line and uh, the first set of bars, probably can't see it up close, is the infrastructure investment between 2010 and 2014 and you can see uh, that we have been investing heavily in the dairy line infrastructure. And then if you move to the next control period, uh, 2015 to 2020, you can see again, uh, without doubt, we have been investing heavily in that uh, infrastructure, probably spending 120 plus million over the last 10 years. And going forward now, um, after the Northwest Transport Hub, we're going to be uh, investing in phase three, uh, which is 20 miles of renewals that is uh, essential to maintain the dairy line. And then the feasibility studies that are ongoing at the moment, um, looking at the passing loops, the capacity and the resilience, not just between Coleraine and Derry, but between Belfast and Derry uh, to increase frequencies. Those feasibility studies are ongoing at the moment, and uh, you can see the figure there, probably in the order of 200 plus million. And at the same time, we're also um, in that drive towards net zero. Um, the rail will be an important part of that. And we have completed our first technical study on electrification. And uh, we're now focusing on the different routes with a more detailed study. And you'll probably see that uh, Coleraine to Derry will probably be a, a hybrid option of electric and battery in the future. So investing in that. Um, one of the topics, uh, next slide please, sorry. Um, thanks Rachel. Uh, one of the great topics at the moment is when we uh, close the railway to do essential renewals work. Um, across our network at the moment, we would probably have two to three hundred people out every night doing maintenance and renewals um, every night of the year. Uh, but some of these larger renewal projects, we have uh, the nights are not long enough to do them. So we have closures at Christmas, Easter and Halloween. And um, we have probably seen that there's been some challenge around those. And um, I suppose particularly at Halloween, uh, and all that goes on up in Derry. However, we have uh, some of that work was aligned with closures with Irish Rail uh, south of the border. This year, you have seen significant work at between Belfast and Derry on the York Gate to Lagan Junction and also out at Kilmacky. Um, that York Gate to Lagan Junction is a, a critical connection between Derry and Dublin and uh, that will now be renewed and that will give uh, 25 to 30 years of life. And you can see that we're working 
in other areas as well, uh, between Belfast and the cross border line. Um, and that's probably why uh, we aligned some of those closures last Halloween. Okay, thank you. Next slide. And just before I move on, uh, I press this Chris slide. Uh, we have some more closures coming up in the next few weeks. Uh, we have uh, some more work on uh, between York Gate and Lagan Junction on that critical connection. And then uh, between the 11th and 19th of February, uh, we have extensive work ongoing between Antrim and Rain. Uh, you probably know it as the Collie Baggy Area Renewals, but it is renewing essential signalling infrastructure between Antrim and Rain to ensure the ongoing reliability of the line. Thank you. So if there's any questions later up on in those closures, I'm happy to take them. Thank you. So thank, thanks, John. And, and you know, it, it is essential work, but we also recognise that we need to make sure our communication is good around these closures and people understand where they are and we provide substitute services which are adequate. So we recognise that's, that's an important area and important learning for us around uh, the Halloween period um, last year. In terms of, I just want to touch on this briefly, there's not a lot more I can say around the All Island Rail Review. Um, it is nearly complete. Um, and the, you know, there's the politics of how that document gets released is a bit unclear at the minute. Um, uh, and we certainly will be asking questions about how, how that happens, depending on how the politics rolls out. But, you know, there is some positive uh, elements of that uh, about investment in the railway across the island of Ireland for the future. Uh, and we hope that that will be will come out soon and, and we start looking at how some of those projects can be funded and how the feasibility plans can be put together. Um, as John has already mentioned, we are already starting to look at zero emission technologies. What does electrification mean for, for the railway and, and across I uh, Ireland um, and across the island? Um, so that's something we're actively looking at right now. Um, and also our enterprise development strategy is very much looking at how do we get an already service onto um, Belfast to Dublin, how do we look at new fleet, and then how do we make that better connection once we get an early on a better connection between uh, Derry to Dublin as well, because if both of those lined up on an early service, you could have a really good service between Derry and Dublin. So that's something, there are ongoing projects at the minute, and we're also putting together appraisals uh, and looking for funding for those going forward. Just two other areas I want to touch on. Just hand over to Mark just to talk about the services just briefly, Mark, you know, that we operate uh, on the dairy line and, you know, some of the challenges we have with the infrastructure and then how we manage that on a day to day basis. OK, thank you, Chris. OK, guys, so look. So next chart. Hi, okay. uh, so passenger growth across the rail network, including the dairy London dairy line, has been, has been strong, particularly in the leisure market. Um, and I would see that there in the passenger numbers at the weekends. and and on our financial lifts. Um, look, new longer trains, um, six car sets have been deployed um, on the Derry London Derry route, um, increasing capacity, so sort of 1,600 extra seats of capacity across the whole of the network. Um, Derry London Derry to Belfast um, is predominantly a single line track, requiring trains to pass um, at the four Bs, we call them the Bell Arena, Balamani, um, Balamina and Bleach Green. This means that the line can be susceptible to not on delays um, and it, it is currently running at capacity um, on an early service. Um, it's quite important to stress that. So the wee chart there kind of signifies that we need a train to be in through that chart and, and out through each section of that chart within 30 minutes. Um, and any delays on that there, then um, we struggle with resilience on that due to our infrastructure. Um, plans are currently in place um, and being developed for summer 2023 focusing um, highly on safety, passenger capacity, performance and service resilience. Um, and then moving on, special trains to and from the northwest can be provided for special events outside, outside of the scheduled timetables um, on Sundays especially. Okay, thanks, Mark. I mean, uh, the focus there is we have limitations in our infrastructure and we, we have to manage that. But we're very conscious that some of the disruption we saw in summer 2022, we need to learn from that and see how we can improve the resilience into summer 2023. So we're working on plans for that. We'll have to come forward in the future and communicate those because we haven't got those details finished yet. Um, but we will be looking at some of the timetable and options there are for us to try and improve the resilience. Um, and I thought I'd just finish, you know, not, not to miss the bus side of, of the business as well, just for Tony and the, on the next chart, um, just to refer to some of the things we're doing to invest in the bus network as well. 
Well, hopefully this is a, a good news story for everyone. So from early, hopefully early July this summer, our full oil metro fleet are going fully electric. We're currently installing 25 superchargers in our Pennyburn garage, which means that there's enough there to charge 50 buses, but we're also putting in the infrastructure to allow us to up that to 80 buses as time goes on. So initially, once we kick in, we're basically going to cover our current schedule and we're going to increase late night services and weekend services initially. And hopefully down the line, as more funding and more electric buses become available, we'll increase our services out to the expanding areas of the town in Skeg and over at Grand Chain and our various parts of the town we're going into. The £32 million pound investment so far at this day, so it's I'm here 32 years as it happened, so this is the most <laughs> significant uh, birthday present I've ever had, I think. <laughs> and we're also in the process of rolling out a new contact contactless ticketing system. So you're able now to get on the bus with your phone, your credit card, tap, tap on, tap off. Great thing that for foreign visitors coming into the city, they just expect us to be able to pay their bus fares using their credit and debit cards, which isn't the case at the minute. So fingers crossed we'll have that. Hopefully around the same time, well, that's a slightly more complex program. And uh, as you can see there, this makes us one of the first cities in Northern Ireland. Well, definitely the first city in Northern Ireland, one of the first in Ireland, one of the first in Britain to have a full electric service. So. Fingers crossed, come the start of July, we'll get you all out for a wee run or new electric bus. <laughs> <laughs> if you could jump over to the last slide there, please. This is just some of the local stuff. We we work with communities all the time. It's something that we don't really push or advertise it well at. Like, I'll give you an example. On Friday, we're bringing a bus into Foyle Street to move about 100 typewriters from a, a shop, uh, their new premises. And you have a look over in the railway station, great public space, which is available to the community to use. So people just get in contact with Mark or myself, we'll have no problem setting that up for anyone. So uh, I'll hand it back to Chris now just to close up. Okay, thanks, uh, Tony. And again, it was just, uh, we talked about some of the investment we do in the local area. It's about some of the community engagement we do in the local area too, across sporting activities. Um, you know, we did do quite a lot at Halloween on the bus side as well, um, Tony. We did this thing at Christmas time, which was the chatty carriages, bringing people uh, who um, are, are lonely uh, and there's an opportunity for them to come together uh, and take a trip from, from Derry down to Coleraine and back again. And that was a good opportunity as well. But there's lots of activities, lots of support there. And that's something we want to continue to do to engage with the community in, in the local area. Um, and that's really it. I mean, the last chart is just a summary chart around how we try to provide a connected service um, from, you know, bus, rail, um, uh, 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 our coach service and also active travel as well. And you can see in the Northwest Transport Hub, we've worked closely with Sustrans to start bringing more cycling uh, and encouraging more active travel as well from, from the Northwest Transport Hub. And that's the end of our presentation and hand it over to yourselves for questions. Thank you, Chris, John, Mark and Tony for that. That was really informative. Uh, my first indicated speaker that I have is Councillor Christopher Jackson. I'm good chair, and just on behalf of Sinn Féin, I just want to welcome you all here to the council. It's great to, to have you here, and um, it's good to see you here with some positive news. Um, and I suppose just come back to you know the the work we 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 know that there's investment needed in in, in the in the Dairy Belfast line. Um, it's been well rehearsed. And it's great to, to see to hear that you are listening and you have been listening, um, and recognise the pressures that are on the line and the need um, to upgrade. And we all expect and we all acknowledge that that um, they see progress, that there will be the enclosures and consultation around that is key, um, which we've learned. Uh, uh, around the Halloween tobacco uh, and 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 the uh, uh, and so so just in, in relation to that, I think consultation is key, and, and it's also very key that that the alternative provision that's put on is adequate. Um, so it's great to hear that that this is that that that's been stated at the outset that that's what your aim and ambition is. 
Um, the All Ireland Rail Review is is long anticipated, and um, we all look forward to seeing what opportunities that that will bring. Um, particularly to this part of the, the island, because it it uh, it's the provision is is clear for anybody to see that it's inadequate. It needs investment, and and in terms of the economic viability of this region. Um, we do need to see better connectivity and rail is very key, a very key component to that. So we look forward to the publication of the Ireland uh, Rail Review and we look forward to um, taking, taking advantage of the opportunities that may come along with it. Um, just in relation to the electrification, and it's, it's fantastic news um, and not only does it will it help sort of secure the uh, and sustain the provision of the bus network within our city and, and district? Given the energy crisis that we're facing, um, I'm sure it's it's a major new major boost for for Transic, but it, it'll have a massive impact on the air quality um, within our, our city as well, and we we've. We've had various reports. We know where the the hot spots are, and I suppose TransLink, in in that respect, they're leading the way. And I would hope that others would follow um, where where we can see where electrification can work on a larger scale. So I'm, I'm, I've no doubt that that's something that council will be um, particularly interested in and and look to see what we can do um, alongside what yourselves are doing. But again, just there's no particular questions. Just they say that it's it's great they have these here. It's great they have these and in, in, in terms of when, when we're, we're talking um, around you know, positive ways forward around instead of of what, what we've experienced the last number of years is where there's just we're constantly reiterating the challenges that we're that we face in the northwest. Um, it's 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 almost that the tables are turned. You are telling us that you acknowledge the challenges and that you are working. Um, they secure investment. They address the challenges, and that's that's fantastic news. So, um, on behalf of our party, we just thank you for coming, and we're very keen to work with you going forward. Come on, Okay, thank you. Thank you, Christopher. Um, my next syndicated speaker is Alderman Devaney. I'm just going to take a couple, and then if there's any questions, you can come on then, if that's okay. <coughs> Alderman Devaney, go ahead. Thank you, Chair, for allowing me in on behalf of the DEP. Can I just welcome the delegation here today to discuss the transport um, uh, and around the council area? And look, uh, um, some good news coming forward here today. And, you know, and around the rail link, I think it's been previously said, and around, look, if there is closures or, you know, for maintenance or upgrades, it is important that, that we look at the calendar of the when that work is taking place and there is a bit of consultation and look to try and keep away from the issues that we had in around Halloween. Um, I suppose, look, I, I've listened to some good news about upgrades and stuff like that there, but the, the, the biggest problem is for, you know, for those who want to use the rail link is getting from London area to Belfast. And how do we cut that time? Because, look, you know, that two hours or two and a half hours or whatever it is, it takes it is massively long for anyone. You know, how what do, what needs to be done to even cut that in half or what type of work needs to be done? Is it a complete new rail line or doubling up or whatever the case may be? Because I, I, I'm not well into these uh, issues and around railway lines and passing and stuff like that there. But it'll just be a question how to cut that time because I think that would be important to encourage many people traveling between here in London area and Belfast, if we had a faster route there and a faster route back again. I suppose then to um, translate locally here, the buses, um, good, good news story, Tony, um, that we're going to be the first. Generally, we're the second or the third, but here we're the first. But congratulations, job, job, well done. Uh, and around that there, and once again, uh, it's about encouraging people on to buses, uh, and it's good to see we are looking at the carbon footprint by moving into electrified buses, and I hope that all works out. 
Tony, the only thing, uh, as you know, I'm a rural councillor and we always talk about the, the city and stuff to get there. Is there any talk about widening that out maybe to rural uh, rural um, villages uh, and especially Strabane, um, which is our next biggest town within the council area here? It would just be important to hear that. But look, other than those few questions and around that, I have to say uh, we're moving in the right direction. Uh, uh, just keep going. Thank you all very much. The Alderman Devaney, Councillor O'Neill. Thank you, Chair, um, and thanks for uh, letting me on as I'm not a member of the um, Just want to thank um, the speakers uh, for their presentation. It's great to have you um, in the Council Chamber. Uh, I'm sure you know how passionate our Council is about public transport and in particular uh, rail. Um, uh, it's, it's, I'd say uh, we discuss rail nearly every month uh, at, at different uh, committees. So, um, you know, there's a real appetite for improved uh, infrastructure um, in the Northwest. I suppose kind of like, um, you know, uh, on the existing service that just to begin with, um, and, and I've raised these points with yourselves before in previous meetings, um, but the, the Sunday service really um, as a two hourly service isn't, uh, it's not very appealing for people. And I suppose, you know, we have uh, proven time and time again in the Northwest when uh, you invest in the service here, uh, people come. So when you build it, we come. And I think we're one of the most well used uh, rail services now, um, uh, Monday to Saturday. And I think, you know, it's, it's, it's about time that we deserve an hourly service on the Sunday as well, because anybody who's trying, who's tried to go to Belfast or even, uh, to Dublin on a Sunday or back, uh, knows that the t you you never actually uh, make the time um, at all. Um, and then just a, another point on the existing service around the airport link. Um, you know, there's been a, a change in our airporter service. Uh, there's a, a new bus service that's taken that over. Um, and again, for anybody who's tried to um, get the uh, connection to um, Alder Grove Airport after five o'clock. You have to get a taxi uh, if you miss the last bus. So um, I suppose, first of all, sometimes the, the train can be delayed and the bus doesn't wait for you um, and you need to get a taxi, um, but it doesn't run. Uh, the, the bus connection doesn't run for the length of uh, time that the trains run for. And like extending that bus connection service, I think will be will be very, very welcome um, because you know, we're one of the only islands um, that doesn't have a, a rail connection to the airport, like yeah. Belfast or Derry. And I think for Derry uh, and Belfast, the train goes very, very close uh, to the actual airport, but there's no actual uh, stop there. So I think that airport link um, would be incredibly important uh, to develop. Um, and I suppose a, a lot of people um, have been in contact just about the Derry to Belfast line. Uh, the existing line, obviously, it's great that phase three um, is is now uh, uh, being uh, funded. Uh, but uh, you know, a lot of people uh, give out about the unreliability of the line. You know, and I don't know if you have any statistics about how many times a, a replacement bus service is actually needed to be used. You know, uh, for that line, and I know a lot of that might have to do with the fact that phase three needs to happen, and it should have happened ten years ago. Um, but, uh, you know, and progress on it has been far too slow, but, you know, that's not to take away from the news that we're, that, uh, that work is going to begin and, and that's very welcome. And, and just to confirm, and uh, apologies, I missed the start of, uh, the meeting, uh, will that mean a nine month closure for the line, uh, for the phase three work? Um, again, the welcome, the, the full Metro, uh, fleet, um, you know, as opposed to a glider, uh, model, I think the electrification of the fleet. Um, is, is a much better move um, and it's excellent. And, and I suppose, you know, with it, I think, you know, whenever you go to other uh, European cities, uh, you see how efficient the bus service is with 10 minute uh, buses every, you know, you don't need to look at a timetable because the bus comes every 10 minutes. Um, so, you know, it's brilliant to see there's development in, in our service here. Are we looking at a model like that uh, for um, the main bus routes in our city? And are we looking at bus lanes um, also? Um, and the contactless system is very, very welcome. So just the last point is kind of on the All Ireland Rail Review. Um, you know, I think uh, the, like the date for publication um, is is almost past, like what was predicted. Um, and you know, is there 
like whenever the uh, department minister left the uh, minister for infrastructure uh, before Stormont collapsed, his indication was positive towards the publication of the Allied Rail Review and also positive towards the reopening of the Northwest Rail Corridor, which you know we're all hopeful that the All Ireland uh, Rail Review uh, points to. Um, and you know if Stormont doesn't reform. You know, well, you, you might have the answer to this, but uh, will we get the the publication um, of the All Ireland Rail Review? And given the direction of travel from the master, will a feasibility study be carried out for the Northwest Rail Corridor? Because that's really the direction of travel that we need to be going. Uh, and you know, I think the time pressures. We, I, we raised this last week at council, but the time pressures for particularly the Derry to Straban or Lafford line um, is important because there's a potential development being built. On the on the dairy road side of it, just off uh, Victoria Road, um, and uh, it's it's important that um, you know a, a, a you know a decision is made around the feasibility of reopening that line um, uh, out of dairy. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor O'Neill. I'm going to bring in Councillor Tierney, Tierney. Then I'll give the team a chance to respond to the questions so far, and then I have four further speakers after that. So, Councillor Tierney, go ahead. Thank you, Chair, uh, and thanks to uh, members of the deputation for uh, coming here today. I think it's the first time we've had a deputation um, in person um, in a long, long time, so um, that progress is, is very welcome. Um, obviously, like others, um, I welcome the, the funding um, around Phase 3 and the, the, the commitment um, is there now. Um, and from our point of view, you know, the sooner we see that work begin, um, the better, um, because we all know, um, and if we, we all, I would assume, have constituents that um, have good issues with the current um, service and, and, and want to see that being addressed, I think this is something now positive, and I think it's good um, that it has been announced. I also think it's good that we have announced, well, it has been announced around the, the bus service um, and the electric, the electric buses um, coming hopefully in July of this year. I know the former minister, Nicola Mallon, um, when she was in post, put a lot of work on the ensuring that um, Foyle Metro was the first um, fully electric fleet um, in the north, um, if not on this island. Um, so that's welcome as well. And I think, you know, for to encourage people and the public transport, um, it has to be accessible um, and it has to be um, inviting and you know there's a there's a growing sense across the city um, of people um, wanting to use electric vehicles, getting people out of the car and the electric vehicles. If we can offer that right across the city um, and district, the better. Um, I would like to see Tony probably more of it down around the Skeg direction, and I, I know you, you wouldn't be surprised at me saying that. Um, but it is, as you point out, you know the fastest growing area that we have in this council area. Um, lots of young families and a good, regular, reliable um, bus service like every other part of the city is something um, that would most definitely be welcome down there. And I know um, that you are currently working on that, and hopefully we'll see some positive signs um, on that. Um, strong public transport for Derry was mentioned in, in, in one of the slides, um, and I fully agree. Um, and I, I do think we need to be to be moving towards that. But whenever you've got a two-hour um, train service on a Sunday, um, it's not really strong. Um, and we need to be looking at how we can get that um, early service on a Sunday um, so that people can um, have that accessibility and flexibility um, in many ways. Like a lot of people, um, I have attended public meetings with um, rail lobby groups, um, particularly under the West, um, around our accessibility to rail. Um, and it's very clear, whilst it's welcome, um, that we do have the, the, the phase three upgrade. If you want to leave the city by train, you can only go in one direction. And I think that's an issue. Um, obviously, the, the all in rail review will hopefully um, identify that. But there is a growing sense um, right across the city um, around linking with Straban, um, Letter Kenny Sligo, and on down that um, direction. Um, what steps have you taken to see um, how that can be done? And if there's a feasibility study either coming or being completed at the moment, um, that would be, be useful. I know uh, we've had lots of conversations with Uncontrol um, around it. 
Um, I think the investment over this last 10 years is something um, that we should welcome. But if we're being honest with ourselves, we're still lagging behind um, on a low, I think it was approximately 120 million over the last 10 years. And was suggested that um, possibly 200 plus million in the next 10 years. Um, but we are where we are now, and, and that for for many people um, is still lagging behind. So I think we we need to, and we look forward to working with you to see if we can support um, that being um, run out. John, sorry, Chris, you mentioned around the, the oil and rail review uh, and the politics around that holding it up, um, and that is extremely frustrating um, for us as it is for you and for potential customers um, as well. Um, is there any sign that a permanent secretary may be able to move on this, or is the hold up until the DUP go back to work? Um, let's just call a spade a spade because that's what the hold up is. Um, and or, or, or have you any signal that, that that can be done without a minister in place? Now, there are some, I suppose, Minor issues. Uh, well, maybe not minor, but there are some decisions that have been taken um, around services um, within the city um, that are questionable, in my opinion. Um, for example, if you wanted to go to Dublin to watch the All Ireland semi final, you had to get a train from Belfast. For a lot of people um, in this city, that was frustrating. Although then there was an alternative bus put on the the ticket to Belfast to get the train to Dublin, um, it would have been a lot um, easier to have a direct service um, from the city. I know that whenever um, Derry City were playing in the FAA Cup final, there were services put on there. But again, they they weren't adequate in terms of the number. You know, it was a limited number. And for the number of people for, that were leaving Derry to go down to both of those games, um, the service could have been um, a lot more and catered for a lot more people. There were also issues around Halloween um, and just some of the decisions that once they become public, you sort of wonder and go, how was that arrived at? You know, who would think that it would be a good idea if you wanted to travel by train to Dublin from Derry that you had to get your own way to Belfast, first of all, and then continue on? You know, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense when, when you're reading it. And I just think some of those decisions could have been made better. Now, they were rectified after um, people like Under the West and other um, lobby groups um, political representatives had contacted and said, you know, what's going on here? But those decisions um, don't instill a lot of confidence um, on the re reliability um, of, the, of the service leaving the city. And I think that's an issue. And I think it's something um, that potentially you, you need to look at and see how and how that decision-making process was, was arrived at and how we can um, make sure that they don't happen again. Now, that's not the pour cold water on, on the announcements um, today around phase three or the electric buses, but I think, you know, if we're going to have conversations, then we have to have the all of the detail, um, the good, the bad, and the ugly, as they say. Um, so those are some of the issues um, that, that, that we have. Um, whilst welcoming all of the all of the headlines, we also have a, a role to to bring up some of the, the frustrations that our constituents um, face as well. Um, but. On behalf of our group, we look forward to working with you. We thank you um, for, for, for coming. Um, and we genuinely um, look forward to, hopefully, the expansion of not only the bus services, but the rail services right um, across the city, and then allowing people that um, reliability um, and options to when leaving the city. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Tierney. I'll pass over to yourself, Chris, and the team, if you want to answer the questions that have been at this point. Yeah, there's quite a few questions there, so rather than taking too much time, I'm going to try and rattle through most of them myself, and then I'll ask colleagues in uh, uh, to help. First one, uh, there's a few questions around the All Island Rail Review. Um, unfortunately, we can't give you any insight into how that decision will be made. Um, um, the report isn't quite finalised yet. Uh, when it is finalised, um, then the decision will have to be taken between the Department of Transport and the South and the Department of Infrastructure about how that gets released, and the politics around that will have to be worked through. Um, so I can't really give you any insight into, into what, what can happen there. But certainly, uh, I think it's been referenced a few times, the route from Derry or from Letterkenny, Derry, Strabane, or Mopoda Down is one of the routes being looked at on that, and you know that would be you know a positive. How we would then move 
you know, we can't really move to putting forward funding for feasibility or anything like that until the review comes out. So we're sort of a wee bit sort of waiting for that a lot to happen. And um, so we're 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 doing some preparatory work in terms of what resource we would need to, to to do that. But we haven't put any detail around the feasibility or any funding around that yet. So that's something that will come later once the review is actually published. Um, so that, that's sort of where we are at the minute, but I say I don't have too much insight into how the politics will work around that. Um, phase three, you mentioned, uh, so I think the question was, uh, will that involve a closure? Yes, it will involve a closure for a number of months. Uh, we're still working through the detail of that and, and exactly when that will happen. Um, but it will involve a closure for a period of time. There will be bus substitution when, when that's been done. So we want to make sure when that happens is that we do as much work around that as possible and uh, to make sure that when we when we open again, we have as much of the enabling infrastructure for any future investment done as well. But it will involve a closure. Um, um, sort of all over the place here, bus frequency, a few together, things like bus frequency extensions to the airport um, and other bus services. You know, as I mentioned at the beginning, we're completely constrained with funding at the minute. All of those additional services, additional frequencies require uh, um, uh, revenue uh, funding, and we, we are constrained, and we don't have any visible label of our budget position for next year either. So at the minute, we'll have, we certainly will take requests in of what people uh, require, and that's not just uh, in, in the northwest here, but, but across Northern Ireland. Um, and at the minute, we will have to, if there's enough funding, we will look at prioritising those. But but right now, we're completely constrained with funding uh, and we can't uh, do anything further on those. So um, apologies, that's maybe not the answer you wanted to hear, but it's the current situation. Um, the question was raised about the Sunday service and being a two hourly service. When we received the funding initially for uh, to do an hourly service after the phase two uh, uh, infrastructure investment, we only received enough funding to do a Monday to Saturday service. And um, there would be additional funding required to do a Sunday service and an early Monday service as well as one of the proposals we looked at. Um, and again, we haven't received that funding as yet, so we're unable to move forward on that until we can get clarity around funding going forward for that. That requires revenue funding in terms of train, train crews, fuel, all of that required to do it. Um, so unfortunately, again, it's something we are aware of and we have produced a business case on, and it's about when, when that would get funded. Um, it was mentioned about reliability on in the northwest, and we recognise that we have had some reliability issues in the past six to nine months, particularly around the summertime, and when it gets very busy on, on the, the line out to Port Rush. Uh, and I mentioned at the beginning that we are looking at that now to see how we could do things differently. We've done a number of different investigations around timetabling, around how the, the main issue is the constraint at Cold Rain, really. Uh, on how we would manage the capacity on the infrastructure of Cold Rain. Um, and even on the way up the train this morning, we were talking about different ideas about how we could do that. So we will come back to you on that, about what we're going to do in that going forward. We will consult with you about what that might mean and how we could enhance and improve the reliability of the service. Um, there are always some compromises to be made on that. And there's also a big safety responsibility on me as the chief executive of Transnet to, to make sure I keep people safe. And sometimes that means that we, we, have, to, we have to manage things in a way where passengers are kept safe. Um, so, so that, that we'll come back to you basically around that. Um, the point was made about consultation around key closures and things like that. We recognise that, that we need to enhance our communication and our consultation, hence the reason why we're here and how we will follow up after this in terms of communicate. We're doing a, a communication session later in February as well uh, in, in the city here to look at how we can communicate with stakeholders better and understand what's happening. And that's sort of, I don't want to get into the detail of the GA final and Halloween in, in detail here, but we recognise that most of the issues there was around communication. The reason why we were able to put on a service on uh, for the um, football final was because it was on a Sunday and we have extra capacity there. We don't have that same capacity on a Saturday. Um, but we know we could have communicated that better and we could have done some ticketing solutions which would have been better for people. Um, similarly at Halloween, Halloween, Christmas uh, and Easter are big periods for us to do closures because it's when we have less people generally travelling. And you know, even in Dublin, there was a big piece of work in Irish Rail in Dublin even though the Dublin uh, Marathon was on that Sunday as well. But we, sometimes you just have to pick time to do that. But we recognise we need to find a way to communicate that better and to look at options as well and consult better with people. So that's something we will definitely take forward and uh, going forward on those areas. Um, um, I'm going to leave the journey time improvements to John, so I'll come back to that one, John. And then the other point was made about Straban and Castle Derg and, and extending our bus network as well. And that is areas that we do want to look at our bus network and then look at how we can enhance the bus network in those areas. And obviously the All Island Rail Review is also looking at Derry Straban and from the Rail Review as well. So that's something we're very conscious of, that it's not just 
um, you know, the main cities that we have, we've got to look at the rural areas as well. Um, so I think I've covered most of the questions there. Tony might want to cover some of the bus questions, but the journey time improvements one, John, would you like to just mention talk to that one? Um, the journey time improvements between Belfast and Derry will be about small wins, uh, seconds and minutes, and just adding those all up. Take, for example, phase three, that will get that speed up from probably 70 or less to 90. That's a win. Uh, but most of them require investment. Um, if you uh, bro Harris curve or the Limavady Junction, um, uh, as part of the feasibility study, we're looking at straightening that out so you don't have to get down to 50. Um, in other areas, again, uh, looking between Belfast and Coleraine, getting those line speeds up. But each of those will require infrastructure investment to get the line speeds up. And some of the challenges around line speeds being at 70 uh, is because of the condition of the rail track and the infrastructure and the lack of investment for 20 or 30 years. So I, there's no quite answer, Brian. It's just biting off one bit at a time and adding them all up. And I, I think uh, that's our plan. Um, can, can we get the journey times uh, between Derry and Belfast close to the car in the future or better than the car? Yes, we can, but it's not tomorrow. And I think the other thing that will add to the journey times is the electrification, uh, because uh, one thing that comes with electrification is improved acceleration and deacceleration of trains and stations. So um, we are also, we have just completed a journey time improvement study between Belfast and Derry uh, with uh, a specialist from GB and there, there are some actions coming out of that. Uh, but I would say it's time and investment and I wish I could give you them all next year, but uh, and we'll just keep working through them and uh, get there uh, as quick as we can. Tony, any other comments you want to make on bus in there? Oh, oh, Councillor Tierney, in answer to your question, yes, we'll be improved time tables and skating. We have. <laughs> we recognise it's the fastest growing part of the city and there's still hundreds and hundreds of homes to be built. So we have a rough draft of what we're planning to do. So I'll talk to you near the time. <laughs> yeah. And Councillor Devaney, absolutely no reason we couldn't use electric buses to run them to Stavane and Lamavati. As soon as the buses are made available to us, it's just a simple matter of getting rid of the old diesel ones and replacing them with uh, the new ones. Thank you. Um, so my next indicated speaker is Councillor Farrell. Oh, thanks. I was sort of having a conversation with a colleague here. So um, uh, thanks for coming. And, and like Brian Tierney, um, we're, we're used to seeing delegations um, on WebEx and not in person. So this is a welcome change. Um, I know that I've spoken to John at our rail working group and had a few questions about, about phase three, and it seems um, that, that there's movement in that. Um, he's haven't gone into a great, de great amount of detail around you know, a timeline for phase three. You understand funding has been secured now, um, so it, it would be good to understand you know, when the work is going to start, when it's going to finish, and when we'll ultimately see the benefits of that investment. And I've got a further question about the feasibility studies. You know, when Nicola Mallon was infrastructure minister, she commissioned feasibility studies for half our um, journeys to Belfast, stops at Strathfoyle, Eglinton, Bally Kelly. Um, and I know th there's been a delay there in terms of those feasibility studies. So could we get an update on whether they've started or when you expect those to conclude. And I would agree with everybody else's remarks regarding the opportunities around the All Island Rail Review. You know, I, I think 
uh, it presents a massive opportunity for improved connectivity for this city and region um, to Belfast, Dublin, Cork, etc. And at the moment, it remains classified, uh, given you know the stalemate and storming. So I think you know that that's something that does need to be resolved as soon as possible. But if we could get some detail on the feasibility studies and timeline um, around phase three, please. Thank you. I, I think we can maybe have a follow-up meeting, get into a bit more detail on this, maybe with John or something like that. But in, 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 in high, uh, high level terms, the um, phase three will be scheduled roughly in the 26, 27 timeframe. Um, we will start the preparatory work for that now uh, and start looking at programming that into to, to the works. But that's sort of roughly the time frame. Now, exactly when we do the closure in that time frame, we still have to do some more work on as to exactly when. And again, it's back to consulting on timing, what else is happening around that time to make sure that we don't clash with something that would be major for, for, for the region uh, and make sure we phase it in such a way that we, we take account of all of that. We also have to make sure we put in you know, substitution services to make sure we can still operate connection to the, to, uh, the city here whenever we're, we're doing that. So we've all of that to work through yet. So there's a bit more detail to be done now that we've got the funding in place. Um, in terms of the feasibility, we are still working away on the feasibility uh, and we would hope to um, have that completed early in 2023. Um, Again, what we do with it at that point, given there's no sort of uh, decision makers to, to do anything with it, but we, we will intend to try and complete it in the next couple of months, John. Yeah, right. um, and then we'll submit that to the department uh, and work from there. Okay. You for that. So I've got three further indicated speakers, so I'll, I'll talk to Gaylor if that's okay, okay. Chris. Hi. Yeah. Um, so, Councillor Ray McHugh. From Ogot, Gaylor, uh, thank you, Chair, and thanks to uh, presentation team today. You are very welcome. Um, my query, um, Councillor O'Neill briefly touched on it earlier, but I don't think it was answered unless I missed it. Apologies if I did. But um, it's in relation to the bus service at Belfast International Airport. Um, Councillor O'Neill is quite right. There, there's a private, the airporter, um, private service services it every hour. Um, but if you miss you have to pre-book that service, and if, if your flight happened to be late and you missed your slot, well, then you're, you're kind of relying then on somebody not turning up then for, for the next hour's collection, if you get me. So if, if that then is full, you're sitting there and you have to wait for the Translake bus that comes in, but then you have to go back into Belfast City and come down the road then uh, to Derry if you wish to go to Derry, or if you wish to go uh, almost or van, it's the exact same. You have to get Translink bus back into Belfast um, to come back down the road again. So obviously it's not it's not very conducive to, to easy travelling. But my question is just around that. Why is there no direct service from Belfast International to Derry? Um, is it just a matter of numbers or is it a lack of investment? Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Rory. Um, Alderman Hussey. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you to the delegation. Uh, if I was Derry City Councillor, I would be over the moon with what's been presented. But I'm a Derry City and Strabane District Councillor, and you've heard this before. Uh, I know that. Um, I, I'm disappointed on the TransLink uh, in the Northwest slide that the 273 isn't included there as a connection to Belfast. Uh, but you'd expect me to say that anyway. Um, uh, and the point is, has already been made. Uh, Alderman De Vene talked about the rural connectivity. And, you know, I really have to chuckle to myself when I hear people uh, talking in terms of 10 minutes, you know, a bus every 10 minutes. Uh, that sort of connectivity doesn't, and I suppose cannot exist in our rural communities. But at the same time, I would like to know if there are plans to increase connectivity in the, the wider rural communities. And I'm not just talking about Castle Derg or Newton Street, I'm talking about Plumbridge and Kiln and the like, etc. A, a bigger bone of contention, I suppose, especially in my own neck of the woods, is connectivity to Enniskillen, particularly with Swa there, despite the, the difficulties that I'll refer to later in the meeting uh, with regard to Swa. 
um, and you know, six times out of ten, anybody getting a hospital appointment in my area, uh, they're probably going to be sent to Swa or perhaps even uh, Tron County or the Oma, whatever. What, what's the correct title of the Oma Hospital? <laughs> you don't know, whatever it is, uh, the, the the hospital in, in Oma. Um, so that sort of connection, particularly I suppose through from Victoria Bridge off the, the 273 route uh, through to Enniskillen. I'm not aware of what service operates along uh, you know, that connectivity through to Enniskillen. We have the connectivity, uh, as has been mentioned, through the 273 through um, on, on through to Belfast. Uh, so that's there. The electrification mentioned and I would welcome the fact that the Stavan Town service would, would fall into that metro style uh, bus uh, and would hope that Stavan Town would receive um, equitable uh, treatment within you know, that town service type run. Uh, Transit talks about Northwest. What are the boundaries that we're talking about when we say Northwest? Uh, I know if I go to book a private hire, uh, I'd be directed to OMA. Uh, as opposed to uh, Foyle Street, uh, although I've had to go to Foyle Street at times on private hire. So, what, where, what are the boundaries northwest? Um, mention is made of the All Ireland Rail Strategy, which which we all endorse and, and welcome, uh, and would like to see developing. Uh, mention has been made. I think it was Councillor Turner referred to Letter Kenny Sligo, etc. I believe the more important arm of that is the old Derry Road, uh, as I would know it, uh, through the Stavan um, on to Portadown, which then gives the connectivity through to, to Dublin, and indeed uh, Belfast on, on a southern loop, uh, and, and increasing the overall connectivity. Um, and one one that I have mentioned before is park and ride. Uh, and, you know, people have talked about electrification of cars, etc. But I would imagine one of, one of the premiums of, of TransLink and government in general would be to declutter, uh, in particular, uh, Londonderry study of cars. And because of the lack of connectivity of public transport, people will drive to the city. But with the improved uh, development of Foyle Metro, are there plans on the outskirts of the city to have park and ride? Uh, developed. I know there, there's, I suppose, a sort of park and ride at the uh, Waterside Railway Station, the, the hub, but I'm not aware of any others. And surely, to goodness, the likes of new buildings, for example, coming in from the southern side, and I'm sure the same would apply maybe around Tromaho, somewhere like that there, that there would be uh, an increased level of connectivity, park and ride, to help uh, take cars out of the city centre and make the city centre more attractive in that way that it isn't traffic oriented. And I mean, that that's part of the, the thing that council are trying to do as well. Uh, so that issue within it all. But as I say, that is not to take the gloss off the actual report. And it is tremendously welcome uh, for the city in general. Uh, and I hope the benefits can extend beyond the city on the, the issues that I've raised there. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Alderman Hosse. That was my last indicated speaker. So, Chris and the team, if you want to come on with any other questions there that have been put to you. Okay. Um, again, I'll try and cover some of the high level and then maybe pass the team for some of the detail. Um, um, bus service to Belfast International Airport has been mentioned a few times. Um, and it sort of fits into the same category as I mentioned earlier about additional frequency, additional services at the minute were heavily constrained. And the numbers would require on that would require significant investment. And and currently we don't have that investment. So so it would be on our priority list of things that could be done in the future. Um, but it, it's constrained by investment at this point in time. Um, apologies. Of course, we should have mentioned the 273 as well and the connection, so we'll, we'll, we'll take the learnings from that. Um, and, and definitely rural connectivity is, is one of the real challenges we have everywhere. At the minute, you know, rural connectivity requires a lot more investment. Um, and um, that's, you know, on one hand, we're constrained with investment, but on the other hand, we've got to find better solutions to that as well. We can't 
constantly be looking for investment of those. So, so that is something that the Department of Infrastructure are looking at in terms of their transport plan um, for Northern Ireland and how that will maybe bring them some solutions about how we better connect rural areas as well as looking at what we do in, in urban areas as well. So again, that's something that, that will be looked at as part of the overall transport plan. And I suppose that, you know, when you talk about park and ride, et cetera, as well, again, that will be part of the uh, Department of Infrastructure's regional transport strategy, working with the council as to how, um, you know, we can better provide transport and provide that modal shift that's required uh, in the city here and in, in uh, other areas like Strabann as well. Um, Bus park and ride tends to be provided mostly by the Department of Infrastructure, and then Translink provides most of the real park and ride. So we'd be looking very much to the department and with the council working together to see how, how that could be done, and, and some of the master planning might, might bring that out as well. Um, and connectivity, you mentioned, you know, Southwestern Acute Hospital, and certainly, you know, I mentioned earlier at the beginning that transport's not a means to an end. It's about how do we connect people up to services better, and particularly when we look at it, some of the changes that are needed within the health service and the health trust. I think transport can provide a solution to some of that. And and when we talk about investing in health, we need to keep it the wider context of health and not just the health service. It's also how do we connect people to the health uh, service as well. And that's something I'd like to see is some uh, some thought around how health investment can actually talk about improving connectivity as well. And um, so I would welcome support in that area in terms of how we would do that. Um, Definitely the Stravana Town Service is something we look at going forward and um, to see what the next phases of electrification are and, and where that would come on that because that could be an opportunity uh, there as well. Um, typically when we talk about the Northwest, we're talking about sort of those Colrean up, so Colrean uh, and Derry Stravana uh, um, Council area uh, is what we're really thinking about and probably not as far as OMA when we think about that, but but there's no, it's, it's a loose sort of uh, description, but that's sort of roughly what we're talking about. Our private hire, we've sort of centralised in a couple of areas just to get just just uh, more for cost efficiency. So that's probably why you're being directed in some cases to, to open that. So it's a separate issue. I don't know if Tony, there's any other points you want to raise around bus that are just briefly. There are plans to have park and ride site near New Baldwin's as part of the development of the road, and similarly on the Bunkrana Road, the Drumahoe current Drumahoe park and ride sites. A large one, and we are as part of this foil metal improvement for the summer. We are looking at what services we can target out that way to give some kind of a link from that site under the town. Okay, thank you. So that's all my speakers and questions. I just want to take this opportunity to thank. Chris, John, Mark, and Tony for coming on for your presentations today for taking quite a few questions um, throughout that wee session and answering them. Um, and I'm sure you'll be working with us as we have our real working group going forward anyway. So um, we look forward to working with you moving forward. Okay, thank you, thank Chair. You. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Yes. Thanks, everyone. All right. Again. So moving on, um, item six on the agenda is chair's business. I've been contacted by two members um, for chair's business. Uh, first is Councillor Jackson. Come here with chair, and I just want to um, come in and use this opportunity to pay tribute to the Bloody Sunday Trust um, for the week of events that they organised and, and put together to commemorate um, those that lost their lives in, in the city 51 years ago. Um, they've, for 51 years, um, we've seen the families um, campaign and campaign for truth and for justice. Um, but they they shine a light on the atrocity that happened in the city, um, both at a national level and an international stage. So once again, the Bloody Sunday Trust has led the way in, in leading and organising the commemorations. And I, I just want to take this opportunity to, to um, commend them for the work and the efforts that was put on it. Um, 
Chair, I know at last month's um, governance meeting, um, we spent about 15 minutes um, discussing attacks uh, on 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 the fountain, um, and it was rightly condemned from from all angles. It was really disappointing, and they see that there was a very small element within the fountain that was intent to stir up tensions and trouble um, in the run up the 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 weekend. Um, so by erecting paratroop flags, and it was disgusting. Um, and I, I just want to condemn in the strongest possible terms those who who decided in the week that was on it um, they cause hurt to the families and the victims of Bloody Sunday um, by erecting um, flags that uh, of the regiment that committed murder in our streets. So I, I just wanted to make that point, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Jackson. Councillor Tierney, are you looking on, on this as well? Thank you, uh, Chair. Um, and I suppose as a member of the Bloody Sunday Trust, I'll declare an interest. Um, but it's that interest um, that leads me to concur 100% with, with Councillor Jackson. Um, I've seen over many years for being involved in, with the Bloody Sunday Trust, the amount of work that goes on um, to planning those events and the amount of time and commitment um, that people put on the, to making sure um, that we can use the platform that the Bloody Sunday families um, have created to show our support as a city, in my opinion, to other people across the world who um, have been the victim of state violence. And I think, you know, that's a really, really tremendous opportunity um, that the Bloody Sunday families have created, obviously facilitated by the trust, but a lot of this is driven by the families. Um, and I think that needs to be acknowledged. I agree 100%. These events don't come off. You know, the planning for this doesn't start in November or December. Um, it starts very, very early on um, in the year. Um, and a lot of time and effort is put on by people who began this to clear the name of their loved ones. You know, they all have a vested interest here. They all understand whatever tragedy the Bloody Sunday Trust and the Bloody Sunday families are trying to highlight in any particular year. They understand directly how those people feel because they have loved their experiences. And I think from the tragedy that they have suffered um, and this city has suffered, to see such a positive outcome um, is inspiring, um, not only here, um, but it's inspiring the, the families of Paul Murphy, the Stardust, Spring Hill, uh, and further afield, um, even right across the world. And I think it's something that should be acknowledged. We understand how difficult it's been for the Bloody Sunday families and how brave they have been. Um, and I was delighted to see at the weekend that our party leader, Colin Eastwood MP, has nominated the Bloody Sunday families um, for a Nobel Prize. Now, how that will work out and how that will turn out, um, only time will tell. But I think it's a very fitting um, nomination. Um, and it's one that particularly in the time that we're in um, around the, the legacy bill and all of that, I think it's something um, that will show once again the support that the Bloody Sunday families have um, in this city. Now, in relation to the Parafly, <clears throat> I was also disappointed to see um, for the week that was on it, um, that flag going up in the fountain. Now, the Bloody Sunday families are used, unfortunately, to these flags going up um, in new buildings and in other parts of the town. But to be up in an area where you could see from the bog side adds that further bit of insult, in my opinion. Um, and I have to say, Chair, I was also disappointed that there was no expression in one way or another from any unionist politician. I myself have condemned 
the burning of poppy reefs in the bog, an area which I was born and raised in. Um, and I have to say, I got some grief about it. I have, and people know, um, have condemned the burning of items which would be precious to people from a unionist background in Gelia, an area where I love. I have come under threat for it, but it was the right thing to do. We don't and never ever have seen that from unionists in this chamber. We never have. I certainly never have. When these incidents go up, these flags go up or soldier F banners or wherever it may be, they seem to go into hiding. It's not good enough. It really isn't. And it needs called out. Those flags should not have been up. The people that put them up should have known better. But the elected representatives of this chamber who have, I would imagine, a little bit of sway within that community and a little bit of standing within that community, in my opinion, should have showed leadership and came out and called for them to be taken down. They didn't do it. And that is shameful, in my opinion. And I wholeheartedly agree with Councillor Jackson and sent my ongoing and full support to the Bloody Sunday families and plead with unionists, do whatever you can to get this stopped because it's insulting. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Tierney. Uh, Councillor O'Neill. Uh, thanks, Chair, uh, for letting me come in on this. Um, I just agree um, with the previous comments. The flying of the parachute regiment flag was completely unacceptable, and you know we, it, it needs to be called out. Um, I think that the difficulty in all of this is, you know, uh, national community, unions community, and all people should be united against the state injustice that was Bloody Sunday, the murder of innocent civilians, like the same parachute regiment that gone down. Uh, uh, innocent people on Bloody Sunday um, and who uh, killed innocent people in Bally Murphy uh, months before also killed uh, two men in the Shankill, Richard McKinney and uh, Robert Johnson um, later in 1972. So, and, and again, unionist uh, leaders have been uh, very, very quiet on condemning the parachute regiment um, for the murder of, of people uh, from the unionist community also. Um, and, you know, and I think you know this is this is where we need to get to, um, and and you know this council uh, and people before profit, uh, we completely support the Bloody Sunday's continued march, the Bloody Sunday families' continued march for justice. Um, you know we haven't seen uh, justice at all, and um, of course uh, we want to see progress in the Soldier F case. Uh, but higher up the rank and file, um, uh, General Sir Mike Jackson needs to be held accountable for. Uh, has role to play in Bally Murphy and Mary and in the Shankill uh, for the crimes of the parachute regiment, and not just here but across the world. Um, and uh, and we as working class communities should be united uh, in that call again against uh, state violence here uh, and everywhere we see it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Neil. Councillor Donnelly. Got my good chair, and I'd like to pay tribute to. Uh, all Bloody Sunday families, and and there was a wide range of events, and uh, you had the Bloody Sunday Trust, and you had our families as Councillor O'Neill, who who had the march, and uh, panel discussions and that in in uh, Pilot Row and that Pilot Row. Uh, regarding the flag, Chair, it's been said here that you know I think it was Councillor Tierney that the people that put it up should know better. I disagree, Chair, because I think the people that put this flag up, it was a very, very deliberate act of provocation, and it was a very, very hateful act, and it was designed to get a response. I genuinely don't believe that it's representative of all the fountain residents. I know that for a fact. Unfortunately, when an incident like this happens, a lot of people retired uh, with one brush, and you know that goes again. We, we when windows were put in in a home in a fountain on top of uh, innocent young children in the, the safety and sanctity of their own living room. I'm not sure if condemnation. You know, people are entitled to condemnation, but I'm not sure how effective. That condemnation is going to be, and I think that what this calls for regarding the, the both incidents, it calls for for leadership and people to ensure 
but it's removed hateful acts like both the attack on a family home and the hateful act of flying a parachute regiment flag overlooking an area where innocent civilians were slaughtered. We have to ensure that that doesn't happen because it doesn't benefit any political ideology or or it's just hate and, and they're designed to, to get hateful reactions. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Danley. Councillor Doyle. Thank you, Chair. I'm not a member of the committee, so appreciate you letting me on. Um, I was out of the city whenever the flag went up, and I was about to contact uh, a unionist member of this council, um, and I didn't get round to it. But I did speak to a unionist colleague in, in the chamber over the last number of days, and whilst there's no doubt that there's a lack of leadership from uh, unionist politicians in relation to this. Um, one of the things that actually surprised me more, I don't, I actually don't know whether surprise is the right word because I don't think I was surprised at all. Um, when the when the colleague had mentioned that uh, the only reason why the police eventually intervened and had the flag taken down themselves was because it was on one of their CCTV polls. Now, I don't know what else, what kind of evidence it is that the PSNI need to have that this type of behaviour is is a potential, if not an actual, breach of the peace. I mean, it, do we have to wait until we get to a situation where, like like Gary said there, that you know young children are sitting in their house and the windows come in around them. But, you know, we know from years and years of this that violence begets violence and whether that's someone putting a flag up and then violence follows that it keeps going and the community is always suffering i have absolutely no doubt that the vast majority of the people who live in the fountain um have want nothing to do with this they just want to get on with their lives and it's a very small group of people uh, who are involved in this kind of nonsense but as well as leadership required from the unions uh you know, politicians the police need to get real about this. I mean, uh, Councillor Tamer is right. It's sad that the bloody Sunday families are not used to this. You know, this is a policing matter. Um, it, it's a breach of the peace. It's as simple as that. And, you know, the, the police dance around these issues every single year. And they need to take leadership on it because, you know, it, this flag was taken down as a result of a technicality. Let's be very clear about it. It would probably still be there now, unfortunately, if somebody somewhere in the PSNI hadn't decided we use this excuse. So they have to take responsibility as well. But I would love to hear from from colleagues from uh, from the unionist community about this. Um because it's you know, I know many, many people who live in the fountain who are horrified by this and who sit in their houses for days afterwards and think what's going to happen now as a result of what two or three people in this area have done. And that's that's their constituents. That's your electors. So I would like to hear from them as to as to how this is going to not be a recurrent feature when I'm, you know, thirty years down the line. Because it is now becoming, uh, you know, you can almost predict these things now, and that's that's very very sad. I think it's an indictment of uh, a lack of leadership from from certain quarters. So I would like to hear from them. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Doyle. Alderman Devaney. Thank you, Chair, for um, uh, allowing me in uh, and around this issue and in around flags. I've said many, many times before, there are many, many issues in around flags. Uh, it's what one finds offensive. What's offensive to one isn't offensive to the other. Um, I hear about lack of leadership um, within the, the, the unionist community. But uh, I will remind um, those from the Republican community who are online here today, representatives, when there were para flags in the bonfire and the bog site, I didn't see them removed, didn't hear anyone complaining very much about them, and they were able to stay in the bonfire, didn't hear calls for them to be removed or anything like that there. And, you know, this is where we're at. Um, you, you know, those flags could have been taken down, you know, I've heard the SDLP, I've heard Sinn Féin, they're doing this, they're doing that. They do, they, 
working uh, on bonfire groups. So, you know, whatever they're doing, it wasn't working. And I have to say, look, and around flags, I think there are issues on around flags. And I, there has to be a broad conversation about all flags that are offensive to everyone. As I said, one is offensive to me and the other uh, is not. Um, I did hear um, Councillor Tierney um, talk about flags. I, I, I believe, uh, I believe, and there has been a lot of good work, I would say, going on um, within the unionist community um, and around flags and discussions and stuff like that. And look, you know, at the end of the day, I wouldn't like to exacerbate the, the situation because we're talking about a flag, a flag, not flags. You know, whether some people think it's right or wrong, it's a flag. So it was not flags. And I did hear Councillor Tierney mention about flags in new buildings. And I would ask Councillor Tierney, did Councillor Tierney see flags in new buildings this year? That's what I want to find out. Did he see Point flags? of order. Point of order and an opportunity, Chair. Do you know flags in new buildings? Do, do you respond to a number of questions that I was asked? Go ahead. Thank you. First point I would like to make, Alderman Devaney talked about the Soldier F banners that were burnt in the bonfire in the bogside a number of years ago. I would like to inform Councillor Devaney, Alderman Devaney, <laughs> that I and former Councillor Kevin Campbell went to that bonfire with the full knowledge at that time of the DUP to try and get them things removed. We've done that. Kevin Campbell as Morris will remember, was a councillor for the Moor, loved in the area, and I was born and reared on it. And I know that other councillors who were outside at that stage of the Bonfire Working Group also went and made those requests to try and get them things removed. A unionist councillor put a video out from the Derry Walls, and that knocked all negotiations out because he was trying to dictate what young people in the bog side would do. That's a fact, because I was there when it happened. And I have no issue in saying that whenever that unionist councillor is in this chamber, because I know for a fact that he can't stand over it. And at the time, privately to me, his own party couldn't even stand over it. So there's the first point. The next point that Alderman Devaney made, I never said that I've seen flags in new buildings this year. I said that they have become used to seeing flags in new buildings in previous years. Alderman Devaney was at the PCSP meeting with me a number of years ago, where I raised with the PSNA, that in my opinion, having to travel from Derry to Straban, where the meeting was held, and pass two parachute regiment flags the last weekend in January, in my opinion, was a hit crime. Alderman Devaney was there. He was a member of the PCSP. And if he wasn't, if he doesn't remember, I'm sure if he asked for the money, not be long getting them. I wasn't talking about this year. I have no issue whatsoever and I've said it before, and I know other members don't either, and condemning these flags. Now, Gary may have a point. Condemnation might not work. And I probably made an off-the-cuff remark and saying that the people who put them up should know better. I think the people do know better, and they know exactly why they're putting them up. And I would love to ask Alderman Devaney, does he know what type of person it takes to actually think about making fun and trying to poke fun at the death of innocent people. Because I think it's sick, to be quite frank with you. I don't think, oh, and I'm, I know that all of the people in the fountain aren't to blame, and many of them feel the same way as I do about it. But in reality, that's what's going on. And coming on here and trying to tit for tat about flags down the bog and all that there, community workers and representatives in the bog have worked for years to try and get this stopped, and will continue doing that. Last month, Alderman Devaney was on here calling out the sale, rightly so, of items at the Christmas market. I had no issue whatsoever in agreeing with him because I think he's right. The difficulty that I have around all of this and all of these issues, and I have always believed and been brought up to believe when it's wrong, it's wrong. It doesn't matter whether it's wrong in the bog. If it's wrong in the bog, it's wrong in the fountain. I work that out myself. Alderman Devaney always, always, always wants to point out what nationalists are doing wrong, they offend unionists, and he's right to do it. But he hides when unionists are doing something, they annoy, they, they annoy nationalists. And that, to me, is the height of hypocrisy. And he needs to grow up, he needs to call it out, and he needs to stand up for what is right. And what is right is condemning whoever put them flags up, and they should come down. 
Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Tierney. I'm sorry. Can I, that. can I just come back in after that because I didn't get finishing chairs? So it, it could be an option of having a private conversation with Councillor Tierney because I'm not facilitating a two way conversation at a committee meeting. Well, look, I, I no. have other. Chair, sorry? Look, he, he called out a point of order or whatever he did and halfway through my speech of what I, what I was to going respond. to say. Uh, and look, I, I, I need to respond. Um, you know, we can throw it back to one another, um, you know, whichever way we like the mindset, but surely there has to be a mindset of those who took para flags and burnt them on the bonfire, took the puppies and burnt them on the bonfire. What sort of mindset of those people? Morris, but with look, all due, yeah, with all due respect, that's conflating two separate issues, and I'm not, I'm not facilitating it. No, I right. want to go back in. Stealing to... flags and burning them down the bog is wrong. Uh. But oh, Joe's flying a para flag in the fountain. Oh. And all the man of any confirm that he agrees with me on that. Because I have no issue agreeing with him. The burning of okay. soldier F banners or para flags down the bog is wrong and it shouldn't happen. Okay. But Chair, I just wanted to finish uh, and around the, the, the other issue. Um, there were speakers here who talked about state violence. I could go on here for Claudia King's Mullen T van uh, and you know it could go on forever. And where was the justice for those people? And I'll end it there. Thank you for that, um, Morris. I'm going to move on. Um, <coughs> Alderman Hussey has also contacted me for Chair's Business. Now, Alderman Hussey, you've asked me for two items. One of them I've been thinking about, and it might be better going through Health and Communities next week, the SWA, if that's OK. Um, but if you want to come in on the, the one we brought in, that's good to go. Uh, I'm assuming that's the second one that contacted you about, Chair. Uh, that, I accept that. I'm not a member of Health and Community, though. Uh, that would be my issue. But I will deal with the first one and let you consider again, if, if you would. Uh, the first one is, uh, I don't know if any of our Spurn representatives are, are aware of this or other other DERG representatives, but it's been suggested to me uh, by staff that five delivery staff um, in the Straban Castle area, Royal Mail delivery staff are, are to be let go. Um, now, we've had this issue in the chamber before about deliveries, etc., in, in the area, so uh, both in Straban uh, and the Castle area. So, I, I would like th that Council would contact uh, Royal Mail and seek clarification. Uh, on on this matter, with particular regard to uh, to the their legal obligation on delivery of first and second class meal, and how this will impact on it if it is true, uh, as I say, it's been suggested to me by uh, Royal Mail staff that they have heard there will be five delivery staff taken off. So uh, I I have a proposal. It's on screen there. Uh, and I would seek a second. Or... Happy to second it, Chair. Councillor McKee. Councillor McKee, it's been seconded in the chat box there from uh, Alderman Devaney, but thank you. Do you, uh, are you finished? Does anybody wish to speak on this item? It's been proposed and seconded as a proposal. Just to let you know, we'll be happy to support it. Supporting, yep. Same. And nobody's wishing to, that's, we'll take that as, as given. Um, we'll get that letter sent off. Um, and I'm still going to ask that that goes through health and communities. It's just a, uh, it's a better fit for the for what they ask us. Um, I appreciate that, and I will contact the chair of health and yep. community to perhaps bring it forward. Uh, I can't obviously make a proposal, yep. but hopefully somebody will support. Me. I'm sure it will be. Support. Thank you, chair. I appreciate no that. Thank you. At all. Um, so moving on um, to item seven, which is the matters arising from the open minutes of the governance and strategic plan and meeting mm -hmm. from Tuesday the 10th of January. Is there any matters arising from last month's meeting that anybody wishes to raise? Let's give it a wee second. No, we're all happy enough. Okay, so we'll move on to item eight, um, which is the A5 WTC consultation on supplementary information to the environment statement addendum. Um, and I'm going to pass over to Karen, who's going to go through that report with us. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. And through you, uh, members, the purpose of this report is to brief members on the recent consultation initiated by DFI in terms of the A5 Western Transport Corridor. 
the department was seeking feedback on published supplementary information to the environmental statement um, and members the response uh, sent from council is attached at appendix one um, this uh, consultation began in november and they had asked for feedback by the 23rd of december um, and the correspondence uh, encouraged anyone with an interest in the significant flagship project to make their views known during the consultation period and members you will recall a notice of motion which uh, members passed in uh, November which is outlined at section 2.3 of your report uh, members in terms of key issues uh, a submission was prepared um, and is attached as I said at appendix one and it has been acknowledged by the department um, and in addition to this uh, the consultation was raised with partners uh, in Donegal County Council during December's Northwest Regional Development Group meeting and Donegal County Council have also made a submission <coughs> to the department. Uh, members will uh, be aware that the Plan and Appeals Commission had planned to reconvene the adjourned public inquiry into the scheme on the 25th of January um, and held a preliminary meeting in November with the department. Um, however, the department had has recently written to the chief executive to advise it's uh, now complying with the PAC's request in terms of information on the longitudinal profile and cross sections over the entire length of the new road. Um, and the department has published this uh, supplementary environmental information and has now extended the consultation period to the 3rd of March. Um, and again, will arrange the public inquiry following on from that. So members, it's recommended that you endorse our submission, which is attached at Appendix 1, and note the most recent consultation um, in, and in terms of obviously council support for the scheme. Um, and if there are any further comments that members may wish us to include, we potentially can go back to the department before the extended um, consultation date of the 3rd of March. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Karen. And the first indicated speaker on this is Councillor Farrell. Uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, and thanks, Rachel, for the report. So I'm happy to propose this on behalf of the SDLP. We recognise that the upgrade of the A5 is long overdue. Uh, it's an essential infrastructure project on the most dangerous road in Ireland. And, you know, We've can, been going on about this for a while. It's been a you know a joint government commitment, north and south, for the last fifteen years, and nothing has been done about it. You know the whole thing has been dogged by delays. We've had legal and or public inquiries, judicial reviews, legal challenges, and it's clear that there's a minute section of society are determined to block this frustrate this entire process so the sooner it's done the better but happy to pro uh, propose uh, council's uh, response thank you thank you councillor farrell councillor mckee um, yeah chair just on behalf of sean finn uh, we're happy enough to second it and it's been well documented within this chamber and indeed the legacy chambers the band of the council dairy city uh, council the need for the, the A5 road, uh, obviously for economic benefits, but more importantly for the fact that it will un undoubtedly save lives. But as I say, we're happy with the response and happy to second it. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor McHugh. I have nobody else indicating to speak at this stage um, and it's been proposed and seconded. So those recommendations will carry forward. Moving forward, um, item nine is the Solis report on strategic fund and alignment, mapping of investment and fund opportunities. I'm going to pass over to John and Richard for that report. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, members, look, a very detailed report there um, before you today, but the key headlines around this is that it's a collaborative piece of work um, led through Solis, um, undertaken across all of the councils um, to commission Egosgen. Um, to uh, take forward this piece of work that sets out all of the various funding opportunities that are currently available or are becoming available, um, to look at the synergies between all of the funding streams that, that are live through those processes, and also to identify um, how they um, each 
um, drill into um, through the revaluation criteria, the various um, sectors that we might tap into for funding. So um, the objectives of that are set out before you. The report is there. Much of um, the detail in that report um, we capture through the work of Richard um, and the work that Richard does for us. Um, but nonetheless, as a collaborative exercise across all of the councils, it's been very, very useful in understanding where other councils are at, how we might best work with them, and how we collectively work with government in particular uh, to help shape some of the funds that are coming forward. Um, the Peace Plus opportunities, um, future rounds of UK levelling up. Obviously, we haven't been successful in round two. And how, in particular, um, some of the opportunities that might arise under shared prosperity funding. Although I do think um, many of those opportunities will be um, rather less limited than are being published. Um, but nonetheless, um, hopefully the report does help bring together um, lots of those strands. And maybe, Chair, through you, if you just want to pass to Richard just to say a few more words on it. Um, not much more to add, really, members. Um, just that, obviously, as, as John pointed out, it, it's it's been a, a useful tool that um, um, you know, looks holistically across um, all of the the council areas and, and, and in particular city areas, maps um, various opportunities and projects against um, uh, the UK UK SBF. Um, uh, in the first instance, but it's actually a tool that could be um, adapted um, and, and uh, as a tool to, to align our own strategies and, and priorities against um, future funding streams that become uh, mechanisms that, that become available. Um, so certainly intention for us to um, um, engage with it and, and proactively use it um, in addition to obviously what we're doing already. Um, um, both to support um, officers internally in, in all areas of, of funding and finance, as well as um, uh, groups externally, and, and as we do through the uh, funding bulletin, etc. So, um, key thing is to obviously continuing to be horizon scanning and engaging with the departments as much as we we, we can, um, all levels, and and really to seek out those opportunities that. Uh, Either currently already on the horizon, or, or that we can uh, um, hopefully, um, um, let's say, uh, activate or, or, or bring forward um, ourselves through engaging um, with uh, the departments both here and um, directly from Westminster. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, John and Richard, for that. Um, it is quite a detailed report. Is there any member who wishes to speak? to this item or wishes to propose or second direct Christopher? Go ahead. Um I'm a good chair and thanks Richard for the report and I suppose happy on behalf of Sam Fendi to propose the report, um to propose the recommendations in the report. It is important that we maximize um any funding opportunities that are available. Um and and I, and I suppose we, we take that holistic approach. We, we know that, and, and it's been well documented around the disastrous impact that Brexit has had um, right across um, all public sectors, but um, and and particularly councils um, around the the loss of opportunities for funding. Um, so taking any strategic approach around um, exploring every opportunity that's available um, is is important and I, and I think in this post brexit society where we've got a Tory government intent to um, squeeze um, any public funding um, as much as they can possibly do um, I think it's it, it's really important that all councils work together. The, the through the mechanisms that are available to us through SOLAS uh, is an ideal opportunity to do that. So from our perspective, um, we are happy to support the recommendations. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Minnie. Thank you, Chair. And uh, I'd just like to second the proposal. Um, and I would echo what Councillor Jackson has said. It's uh, at this moment in time, when we're going through a, a difficult pro rates process, I think this is a small investment and it clearly shows that um, there's a lot of clearly will identify 
um, a lot of, you know, funding possibilities for this council, and uh, it's probably needed. And this is a useful tool, a very useful tool to allow council and our councils to identify sources of funding, external sources, and it's a and it's a good exercise in collaboration amongst our councils and the others in, in our area. So, um, the SDLP, I'm happy to endorse this and second the approach. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Minnie. I don't have any further indicated speakers, and the report has been proposed and seconded with no one speaking against. So, um, that's we're happy to move forward on that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, item 10 is our schedule of meetings. Uh, for 23-24, and I'm going to pass to Ellen for this report. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, as indicated there, the aim of this report is to seek your approval for a proposed schedule of meetings for the year 23-24 set out in Appendix 1. And also, as indicated in the report, uh, at the start of this Council term, we agreed an approach to the scheduling of meetings, and, and there have been sort of a few refinements along the way, which have been indicated in Section 2. Um, those principles and practices have been taken into consideration uh, as far as practicable in developing the schedule that's at Appendix 1. And I would just highlight to members a change in the date of the annual meeting um, from what was previously indicated as the 22nd of May to the 5th of June. Uh, and also that um, we have previously agreed that there would be no meetings past the end of March. But due to the sort of change in dates in the elections, the monthly um, March Council meeting has now been rescheduled to the Wednesday the 29th and Thursday the 30th of March. The recommendation in front of members then today is that the schedule for 23-24 is adopted. Thank you, members. I'm happy to propose, Chair, to whosoever that may apply. Thanks for that, Alderman Hussey. Um, is there anyone that wishes to speak to the report? We have it proposed. Can I get a seconder? Second it. Who was that, sorry? Rory? Good, McKee. Thank you for that. Thanks very much, folks. So we'll move forward. Um, the next number of items from number 11, the number 17, are open for information. I'm going to take them together. Councillor Gallagher, are you looking to come on on item 11? Go ahead. Thank you, Chair, for letting me stand. Chair, just I am I'm seeing this report on item 11, uh, the Leveling Up Fund. I, I have to say I was very shocked at the outcome of this process when our council submitted uh, a number of bids, but in particular a bid from Straban, where it wasn't even looked at. And the reason it wasn't looked at is by looking at the report, there was uh, ministerial manipulation of the process. And when we look at this uh, and we change the criteria, we see I agreed to fund up to one bid by local authorities, per local authority. Uh, and we didn't get any. And I see that there has been 10 have been successful and I haven't seen who they are, but has every our local authority in the north been successful with the project? And we haven't. And we quite clearly see the manipulation that's going on here. I have a number of questions I think needs asked. Who who are the ministers that made these decisions? Can we as a council legally challenge them? And is there an appeal mechanism? And if so, are we making an appeal to challenge these processes? Because I think that the impact that this decision has made, particularly on Straban, is massive. Massive. And it has a massive knock-on impact on other projects on our city. And as a council, we should not be sitting back and just accepting this. Because this is definitely, Chair, it's definitely unacceptable that Straban 
and it's a, a well-known fact across a uh, level up it has an investment over years there's been disinvestment and we need to challenge it thank you Chair. thank you councillor gallagher uh councillor farrell we look at on the same item well, it was just a question and you know i, I note councillor gallagher's concerns and you know we in the slp are, are equally disappointed that you know the buds that this council area submitted were ultimately unsuccessful um i know we did well last time around in october 21 everything we submitted was funded um unfortunately that that wasn't repeated this time around and specifically about uh the upgrade to the straban leisure center like the british government just moved the goalposts without telling anybody um but my question is I would have expected in the pack to see it, the copy of the correspondence, uh, which informed us that we were unsuccessful. So, did we get any feedback at all as to um, was it just a dear John? <laughs> in, in all senses of it, uh, you were unsuccessful, or or was it you didn't meet the scoring criteria? Was there any detail at all? Because you know people are keen to know why the bids weren't successful. Well, we are, anyway. Yeah. Thank you, Councillor Farrell. Alderman Jose. Um, thank you, and like others, I, I would share concerns. And uh, as I was reflecting on Councillor Farrell there, I wonder where the, where the victims of our own success. Um, but at the same time, that doesn't take away. I mean, the whole ethos of levelling up is that you go to the lowest and you bring those in the lowest uh, sector, you raise them up. Uh, therefore, one does have to ask, you know, why would you have something that works on that basis and then all of a sudden decide, oh, we'll allocate one to each of, you know, the councils and leave out uh, their city and Strabane because they were successful first time. Um, and I would like to, to know what the criteria, the scoring was, because it should be comparative. Uh, and those with the best score, uh, which would include uh, deprivation level scoring as well, those with the best score uh, should be top of the list. End of story. So similarly, similar concerns uh, um, to others. Um, and in a way, think to myself, did we overachieve? But that is no excuse for not being successful in round two. Uh, and indeed, mindful that there, hopefully there will be around three and we don't want to find ourselves in the same situation again. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Alderman Hussey. Uh, John, I passed you with those three questions that have been posed. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, look, we can collate and send out the letters received. I was just trying to see if I could find them on my phone there. I don't know if you have them at hand, Richard, but they were they were very succinct. Um, they, they simply said out that we weren't successful. Um, they advised that there, um, there, there would be some form of process where we would seek feedback, um, and that has been set out. I don't know, Richard, if you want to provide any more detail on that, um, but um, we can certainly send out those letters that we received as an addendum to this report. Um, appeal mechanism, I'm not so sure that that has been clearly set out to us. Um, I think one of the key suggestions we're almost inadvertently making today is that we don't believe that the totality of what was indicatively set out for um, the quantum of funding for round two has been announced. Um, so either that quantum has been changed um, or there may be opportunity for further announcements. Um, we, um, through what we've been advised, are the sums that may be available have calculated that potentially £24 million of money for Northern Ireland through round two hasn't yet been announced. So um, certainly our suggestion would be that that's the space that we work within um, to see if there's opportunity there for to understand if that £24 million still exists in round two and to understand whether there is opportunity still to apply for um, that um, that funding that was indicatively um, set aside. But we will be um, seeking advice or seeking feedback on um, the criteria. We put in very strong bids 
exceptionally strong business cases, probably stronger the second time round than the first time round. Um, so um, we certainly don't think that um, the non-inclusion of the projects in round two um, reflected on the strength of the bids that were put forward. Richard, do you want to come in any further on that? Um, yes, uh, Chair, just, just to add, uh, the letters were very um, succinct, as John put it. There wasn't any direct feedback in those. Um, in respect to an appeals mechanism, um, there maybe isn't one. Um, certainly, that's that's. Um, it was uh, decisions made by uh, ministers. I think there was a question around who those ministers were. My understanding was it's the Prime Minister, Chancellor of the Exchequer, and um, ministers from DLUC and I think Bayes and obviously any other relevant ones which were in relation to transport, etc., um, from bids across the the, the UK, um, GB and, and here. Um, also understand that you know um, Northern Ireland officials were engaged at some point, um, but that was more, uh, I believe, in respect to strategic alignment of projects. Um, and then, um, yes, as in, the only other point on feedback is that the, the letter cited that, that stated that we will receive feedback in due course. So we'll obviously be seeking that to understand where we scored and, and um, yeah, if there were any issues with the applications or bids. Chair, just to, just to further add, just in terms of some statistics around it, and I, I suspect this is the, these are the statistics the government will quote us. Um, Round one was 49 million um, for Northern Ireland. This council, as we know, was successful um, in achieving 16.3 million of that. So almost a third of the total funding pot available in round one um, was allocated to this council area. And overall, to date, between round one and round two, and I think this has to be looked at in totality, um, um, 120 million has been allocated, of which 16.3 million is 13.5%. So um, I am assuming the rationale will be um, that um, uh, UKG treats Northern Ireland as a block and doesn't differentiate between parts of Northern Ireland in terms of the levelling up agenda. Um, and we assume that's the rationale um, with regard to how they've allocated the funding. But we will probe that further through the um, mechanism that has been set out in the letters. Thank you. Alderman Devaney, we looking on this item? I was, Chair. Thank you very much for allowing me in. But uh, jo John has probably nearly answered all the questions we're going to ask have been asked before. But look, um, uh, on behalf of the DEP, we're disappointed that, that we didn't get any funding through this um, allocation of funding for the level of funding as as previous speakers said, you know, we would be interested to see um, what the feedback is uh, and, you know, look at the feedback and the criteria. And I don't doubt, John, that our officers had put in very, very strong applications. Uh, we know how dedicated they are to that piece of work. Just disappointed, but look, uh, um, I think the feedback will be um, where maybe others gained money or where we f fell down or whatever. Maybe you, you look at the situation, I think, John, you quite rightly said it. Uh, the last time round, we got third one third of the funding, uh, which was substantial. And we welcomed that broadly um, uh, uh, across the council area. Uh, but interesting to see what the, the feedback will be. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Alderman Devaney. Councillor Gallagher, you said you have one more question just for John there. Thank you, Chair for Lemison. Appreciate it. I just the question. The question of as as in again as in regard to the Strabane, but <clears throat> like all the council talking about putting them strong buds, and we weren't successful. The Strabane bud was a, a legal bud that met the criteria at the time of submission. Then the criteria was some way manipulated through a process, and no matter how strong the Strabane bud was. It never got assessed, and we spent time and money putting together a bid that the process was manipulated, and I think that we would have a legal challenge to the process because our bid for Straban wasn't looked at. So it didn't the Straban bid didn't fail. It wasn't looked at because the process was manipulated, and I think. That that's what we need to challenge. 
Okay. Um, Councillor Tierney. Chair, thanks. Um, keenly interested um, around the points that Councillor Gallagher just made. Um, they weren't initially um, what I was coming on to ask. Um, and his response, John had um, said that there was between the two beds, 120 million or there or thereabouts, worked out at about 13 per cent um, for the 16.3 that we got. I would like to be keen to know how that compares with other councils um, across the North, taking Alderman Hussey's point on board that, you know, where we are a victim of our own success, but over the entire pot, how does that equate 13, I think it was 13 odd percent or whatever it was, how does that compare to other councils? And in relation to Councillor Gallagher's point, um, particularly around the, the, the Straban, but um, do we do you officers think that we have a case to be reviewed? If you know we spent that amount of work time preparing that bid, and then after the bid went on, the process was changed and it wasn't considered. You know, is there a case there? Thank you. John? Uh, we can certainly um, provide the detail on the balance across the other council areas. Cursory look at it, um, and it's been a while since I looked at the chart, um, but we were, were there or thereabouts in terms of the allocation of funding. I think Fermanagh and Oma has been awarded $20 million, um, towards a leisure centre. Um, uh, but I think that was probably the highest award. Would that be true? Yeah, yeah that's the highest award. So you know, sixteen point three um, from to us is is broadly probably one of the highest. Um, but we can we can set that out and bring it back. Um, I think, and I'm conscious of the fact that we're an open business. Firstly, um, but I think um, I think I'll take advice uh, in terms of the. Uh, potential for a legal challenge um, with regard to the process that we've been underway. I think um, I think it's a very good point that's been raised by members. It's something that certainly we're considering as officers. Um, and I think in response to the discussion today, if you're comfortable, um, we'll, we'll, we'll get some um, legal guidance on the uh, on whether or not um, there is scope for challenge. Chair, quick, quick one there. Yeah. Is there an appeal to process? Not as far as I'm aware. I think that was the point Richard had made that there wasn't. Is that right, Richard? It was part, no. There's not. Councillor Tierney, were you looking to make a wee point there? Just, Just and, and John's point around the, the, the legal stuff and appreciate that he's taken advice. We were kind of not going to ask the question because we knew there was none here. Um, but I think it's, a, it's an important point. Could, it's not to say that we don't have enough to consider um, on Monday, but could this be factored in to Monday's special confidential meeting? Because just conscious, John, that the, the clock's ticking um, on this and we might not have enough time to, to prepare um, a legal challenge. We already with the full council. They, they have this considered. Yeah, happy enough for that. Okay. Yeah. yeah, okay. Um, okay, so moving on, is there any other items under the Open for Information that any member wants to raise or speak about? So Jackson, go ahead. Chair, um, item 16, the, the Housing Council update. And, and I just want to highlight that it, it is, it's welcome that, we've, that we're receiving. Um, updates from from housing council but when I, read, I was disappointed when i was reading through the report um now the report um indicated that there was a report from Grania long the chief executive of the housing executive and and it was very very vague you no know, it, it just that a summary of the current and emerging issues were outlined and it referenced industrial relations, you know, uh, the, the review um, in relation to damp homes and, and quite a lot of things that we've been discussing as a council um, and issues that, that are affecting um, people here. You know, but when you, when you factor in that 
an issue of industrial relations. Um, the housing executive maintenance workers are currently the, the longest striking um, workers uh, uh, currently, and well, they're, they're six they're six months on a picket line. And I was hoping for more of an update than just to say that there was a summary around industrial relations. Um, I don't think it's good enough. Um, I, we would like to know. Um, we would like to have more detail from growing along around what what what's different. Um, what, what what is the position of the housing executive? Um, what 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 are their what what are their plans to find a resolution to this? Um, because in the absence of an assembly, um, this this is one of the only mechanisms that we've got to find out. Um, information around vital public services and the information that's contained in this report is is very scant um, to say the least so I'm not I'm not entirely sure how we can we can ask for a more detailed report coming out of these housing council meet, meetings but um, and on behalf of ourselves um, we would we would be keen to see a lot more so I just want, I just wanted to put that out there to see, to see what what can we do. Um, they have a more detailed. I know one there is a member of this council that's that that sits on the housing council. Um, but I haven't heard any sort of update um, coming back from the council housing council. And there's there's huge housing issues um, that that are affecting not least the industrial action. It's currently underway with housing executive workers. So um, I just wanted to flag that up. I was welcome to see it on the report, but I, I would I was I was expecting and hoping for a lot more detail. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Councillor Jackson. Councillor Doyle. Thanks, Chair. Councillor Jackson is absolutely right. Um, because there's been a number of issues as well that I was interested in uh, around the dump aspect. Um, I, and I've had to contact the the Secretariat, I think her name's Kelly. Um, before to try and get reports, but they certainly. I mean, if we've got a rep on the housing council, we should be getting the papers for it. If that's something that we can, we can do. I'm sure we can maybe drop an email and see if they can do that because we definitely do need to see the inner workings of all the reports that are coming through. We'll follow that up. Thank you. Um, is there any further items that any member? Uh, just a declaration of interest, uh, Chair. It was remiss of me. Uh, I'm Chair of the Northwest Regional Development Group, item 13. Okay. No bother. That's noted. Thank you. Anybody else? Any items on the open for information that we wish to speak to before we move on to confidential? <coughs> Can I get a proposer to go on to confidential, please? Councillor Farrell and a seconder. Alderman Hussey, thank you. I'll just give it a wee second. 